Well, good morning, church. So glad that you are here. Let's worship the Lord together. Midweek Blast is this Wednesday. Join us from 6 to 9 p.m. for a picnic out on the church lawn. We will have burgers and hot dogs to bring a side and dessert to share. The next senior adult event will be on June the 25th in the Upper East Room. It will start at 5.30 with finger foods, popcorns, and drinks. The movie Life Mark will start at 6 o'clock. See you there. We are collecting cards of appreciation for the Joplin Police Department again this year. We are needing 112. The deadline to turn the cards in will be June 30th. If you are interested, please contact Leah DeHoyos. Please return all cards to the box at the Welcome Center. Get signed up for Mega Camp and VBS. Join us July 16th through 20th from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Get registered soon. Some classes are limited. We've had so many questions about the progress of the Pittsburgh Church plant. So I want to invite you Sunday, June 11th. We're going to have a short informational and interest meeting right after the second service in the Worship Center. You can come and hear the plans, learn how you can pray for this ministry, and hear about opportunities to partner with it. Thank you, church family, for your support for our New York City Storehouse Mission Team. We're excited to announce that every student and leader is fully funded. Please continue to pray for this team as we prepare for the trip.
Buzz. Hey, good morning, First Baptist. I mentioned to you last week what a joy it is to be able to get to the church early and to see so many volunteers serving uh, behind the scenes. Let me just tell you, this has been an incredible week and weekend of service uh, for many here at First Baptist. Uh, we had many volunteers, great leadership, uh, go and take our kids out to green country, our third through fifth graders. Uh, they got to spend the week with them, and, and many of you, though, even though you weren't able to go, you joined with them in prayer, and we just are so excited to tell you of, of the decisions that were made. One of those decisions was a young lady who gave her life to Christ. So uh, go ahead and give the Lord a hand and encouragement in that. And not only did we have many volunteers and, and workers and, and prayer partners in that ministry, uh, First Baptist Church also was able to partner with a sister church in an outreach event. So uh, this Saturday we were partnering with them, and, and there were several, several out there that were helping, coming alongside as a body of Christ. Uh, serving others in their outreach campaigns. So you, you don't always get to see that, but as a pastor, it's great to be able to see so many people selflessly serving and honoring the Lord and living their life truly on mission. Um, if you are one of our first-time guests this morning, two ways you can connect with us. Uh, we're going to connect with you through the service, but you can connect with us through the Connect card. You'll find that in the seat back in front of you. If you are here, we'd love for you to fill that out with as much information as you feel comfortable with, or you can scan the QR code that's up on the screen. That'll take you to our digital connect card. Uh, really quick, you can fill that out, send it, uh, and we'd love to, to exchange that information for a gift. It's just our way of saying thank you uh, for being a part of worship here at First Baptist. Some of you old-timers may remember, and I say old-timers, I'm talking a month ago, you may remember uh, that in your, in your bag you got chocolate. Uh, those days are gone. Times are hard. <laughs> Have you tried to price chocolate lately? Y'all got mints. Not any mints. They're still nice. They're not chocolate nice. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, let me just say this. Um, we, we do have that interest meeting, uh, interest and, and informational meeting. It will not be long. It's not planned to be long. Um, so it's going to be right here in the worship center. So if you are interested, want to learn a little bit more about how you can pray, learn about the plans, and learn how you can partner with that, we'd encourage you to stick around. You might want to move on up to the front row, somewhere front and center, uh, so we can have that. Again, it will not take much of your time. If you've got a roast in the oven, you still should be okay. We are going to be packing up later this afternoon and heading to Pittsburgh, where we're going to have an interest and informational meeting there at Lincoln Park. So a lot of things going on today. This is a card uh, that we're going to be handing out with ways that you can pray. If you would like one of these, you're not going to be able to stay at the meeting, uh, let me know. We can get some of these sent to you. We can have extras printed up for you um, in the office as well. We'll make these available for you. So we're also going to be taking up our offering this morning. You see we got our plates along the front. If any time during our song service you would like to uh, drop your offering in the plate, you can do that. We also have the black box. It's back by the doors. You can drop that in as you leave. Or, of course, you can always use our e-giving or through the mail. But I pray that as we give this week and as we designate this section of the service to give both our hearts and worship and, and, and our, and our uh, resources to His kingdom, I pray that we would just be mindful of all that God has done for us, um, our health, our jobs, everything that He has provided for us, and that we would seek to be the best stewards we can be of those resources that God has trusted us with. So church family, I'm going to ask if you would to just pause with me as we pray together this morning. God, there is none like you, and we are convinced of that this morning. Father, your goodness is just incredible to us, and I know as we pause to, to think about what you've done in our life, for those that have been saved, God, to just consider an eternity with you forever to consider that every one of the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that we would be mindful of how you have given and the things you've taken away. And Father, truly only in, in heaven will we be able to fully understand the things that you've protected us from, the things that you shielded us from, the times you moved us away from things that would have brought harm or hurt, Father, the things that you allowed us to go through that brought strength and boldness, the things that you've used in our life, Father, to bring us lessons about your greatness. 
So I pray, Lord, that in light of that, we would just be mesmerized and, and stand in awe of the greatness of the cross and what that means for us. And that we would decide right now, this morning, Lord, to live our lives as a demonstration of worship to the only one that truly matters, Jesus Christ. In His name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 11 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has given him counsel? Or who has given him a gift so that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to worship Jesus together, church.
I want to be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one. Sing it, church. Father, we just recognize you as the great I am this morning. Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice that bought our freedom. 
Lord, I pray you'd block out distractions this morning. Clear our mind and our hearts so that we can hear from your spirit as we open your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Rarely does the Bible record Jesus enjoying a meal peacefully. His words, his actions, the guests, the topics, even the questions often resulted in conflict. And if you think your table gets crazy, just hold on. This next section is full of tension and grace. This morning, it's almost like the same song, different verse. Jesus is at a meal with a Pharisee and his Pharisee friends, and there's a healing that takes place on the Sabbath. We all know that's highly combustible in the Gospel of Luke, all of these combustible factors. But what's interesting in this story, which again is part of a section that is exclusive content in Luke's Gospel, which next week another one that is exclusive to only Luke's Gospel, what we find here is that the miracle, even though it is center stage, it's not center stage in the way we would think of it as being. Where before, what happened was when Jesus would perform a miracle, that would be the fire, the gasoline on the fire, and there would be all of this commotion and and anger, and all of this boiling up, that's not the case this morning. This miracle that Jesus performs happens very quickly. There is very little description about the miracle. But that one event, that one miracle that almost goes unnoticed, if you're not careful, that one miracle becomes the teaching focal point of the rest of His time in that house. So even though we're going to talk about this miracle that we could easily overlook, that miracle literally is the table of contents. It is the object lesson. It is the outline for everything else Jesus says in the rest of the text this morning. I want to start in verse number 1, 24 verses this morning where I'm only going to preach from verse 16 down to 24, but I think in order to keep this in context, I want to read all of the first 24 verses of chapter 14. So join me if you would. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. And when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let me stop in verse 11. Did you catch the miracle? Really quick. Jesus uses that moment, which was more than likely set up for him so they could find some reason to find fault in him because he had healed on the Sabbath before. This was probably, possibly, an arranged situation, and Jesus heals. And he uses that as a reminder of if any of us were to have had an ox or a son that fell in a well, even on the Sabbath, we are going to do the work to get them out. 
What Jesus was saying to everybody in the audience in that house was this guy, this man, is worth the work. He is reminding them of the value of the man he just healed. That his value was of more value than an ox. And he was considered like a son. In verse 7 through 11, Jesus warns of the peril of self-exaltation. He reminds us to be humble. If you want to talk about the walk of shame, that's where that would come from, in, in a sense. This person who has exalted himself and then been humbled or shamed because he is now asked to go back to a lower place. Jesus reminds them as a principle, take the lowest place, the place of humility, so that you may be exalted. And he shares that principle for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And then in verse 12, he said to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So in that first teaching, Jesus was telling everybody about the ox and the sun. And then he speaks about exalting yourself and the caution on that to those who were seeking the greatest places of honor in the seats, the head of the table. And now he turns to the one who invited him and said, when you throw a feast, invite the poor, the lame, the blind, the crippled, invite those who cannot repay you. Now that's not to say that we're not to have dinners with friends and family. What he's saying is use your meal, use your table as a ministry. Use it as an extension of good in the life of those who may be overlooked. Use that meal, that table. Be intentional in who you invite that may not normally get an invitation. Invite those who cannot repay you. Do not use your good as currency in order to get something back. Jesus reminds us in this practice and principle that you and I should be people who are focused on getting our and receiving our rewards in eternity. And that's what he lays out here. And then something happens. In light of all of this conversation about banquets and places of honor and invitations, somebody chimes up in the room, and this impromptu declaration is made. Look at verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, the same things we've heard, he said to him, he said to Jesus, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore cannot come. He did not even ask for an excuse. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you have commanded has been done And yet there is still room. The master said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of the banquet. This man hearing about the places of honor and humbling yourself, Hearing about inviting the poor and the lame, shouts out, Blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. And that's a true statement. Blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. That is true. Jesus does not argue 
the validity of that statement. Jesus does not rebuke the statement's truthfulness. When this guy says, blessed is, are all of those who he'd read in the kingdom of God, Jesus would agree. Jesus is not attacking the validity of the statement. Jesus begins addressing the guest list of the party. You see, this man, more than likely, was a representative of all of the Pharisees and all of the religious elites in the room. And all of Jesus' teaching about us, this man being of more value than an ox. Uh, and, and all of Jesus' teachings about taking the low spots. All of Jesus' teachings about inviting the poor. Remember, He's addressing them. He said to the master, uh, the, the man who invited Him. He said to the people in the room. These were directed to them. And this man says, blessed are all those who he'd read in the kingdom of God. You know what happened here? All of Jesus' very directed and pointed teachings to them went straight over their head. Everything Jesus said to those who were seeking the high places of honor, it went right over their head. If this man really is indeed a representative of all of the religious leaders in that room, when Jesus was saying, invite the poor and the lame, this man didn't get it. In essence, we could derive from this that this man is saying in his mind without saying necessarily is I am blessed because I will be eating bread in the kingdom of God. That's what we can take from what this guy is saying. All of those teachings, all of those points, all of those direct statements made directly to them seem to go over their head and they're basking in this idea that they are going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus does not deny the validity of the statement. He begins focusing on the guest list. Everything Jesus says now ties into his healing of the man with dropsy or edema, swelling. Everything he says, everything that man says, everything Jesus is going to say in this house deals with the guest list. Jesus is telling this guy, I'm not so sure you're on the guest list, friend. These words that Jesus is saying are so incredibly chilling. What we're talking about here is much more than a banquet. Remember, the man's declaration is, blessed is everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God. This man does not say, blessed is everyone who eats bread at the table with Jesus. Here, today. This man is talking about what we would understand to be heaven. So Jesus' teaching is dealing with that same line. When Jesus is talking about a man making a, preparing a banquet and inviting people, he's not talking about a real party in the sense of, that we would think of as a banquet. He's using this to describe heaven. Jesus is talking about an invitation to heaven. Number one, look at the banquet. I think it's important for us to realize that the banquet in Jesus' day was a party. Some of them would be to celebrate milestones, weddings. Some of them would be religious banquets uh, revolving around their religious calendar, recognition and remembrance of God's goodness to them. But here we don't know the exact setting of what Jesus is talking about in the banquet. But what we do know from the time is the banquets were full of food. Did you see that thing just fly and hit me in the face? All right, I just want to make sure. It flew right by you, Chad. Is that a drone? I want to make sure that we understand that there was plenty of food. Now think about this for a minute. Jesus is talking about a banquet. Of all the things he could have done, he hit me right here. I've preached a long time, and I've never been hit in the face by a bug that I can remember while preaching. Think about this banquet for a minute. If Jesus is using this banquet to describe heaven or to give us a picture, think about all the needs that are met at a banquet. First of all, there's food. 
There's not just enough food to get by. There's plenty of food. It's a party. It's a celebration. It's good food. It's beneficial. It's, it's, it's a, an abundance of food. That's what happened at banquets. There was often a huge amount of food, a huge guest list, a huge party. So I can take from this that maybe heaven, in a sense, has this idea of satiation. I'm going to be satisfied uh, physically, even though we don't think of it in the terms of physical. By the way, Revelation chapter 19 speaks of the marriage supper of the Lamb. One of the first things we get to do in heaven with the Lord is sit down at the table with Him and enjoy a meal. That's, what, uh, that's part of this picture of this banquet. There's not just a physical aspect to it, but there's a social aspect to it as well. You don't go to a banquet with one or two people. You go to a banquet with a guest list. There are a lot of people there. My social relational bank is going to be full. I get to go and I get to eat a lot of good food that's going to meet physical needs. I get to enjoy the company of other people. I get to laugh. I get to celebrate. I get to enjoy their company. There's an emotional aspect. I'm with people. I'm not lonely. I'm not sad. I'm in in the middle of a party. I get to experience joy. I get to laugh with other people. Here we see physical, social, emotional. And if I take it to the spiritual sense, and that this is a picture, uh, a picture as dim as it may be, a picture of heaven, I get to sit at a table with a host. I get to not just enjoy, I get to not just be satisfied physically, emotionally, socially, relationally. I get to fellowship with the God of all creation who has invited me. That's the banquet that Jesus is is drawing a picture of. It's a party. And I know you're you're going to hear me say that several times this morning, is that Jesus is describing a party. Well, let me tell you something. I really believe that heaven is going to be an incredible party. And I say that not knowing exactly all what takes place up there. But I know the God who created me and made me and fit me for heaven as a believer. And I know the joy that I'm able to experience on a level down here worshiping, of which this is simply a foretaste of that great party in heaven. And if I think about that, and I get so much joy from being here this morning in this place, shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters, if there's no greater sound in my mind than hearing a room full of people worship God together, can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? And it's not just a party when we get to heaven. Let me tell you, sometimes it may not feel like a party, but thankfully, we still have physical satisfaction. We still have emotional, relational satisfaction. Thankfully, we still have spiritual satisfaction that we can still be with the host even though not beholding him face to face. Down here, it can be rough. Sometimes down here, it does not always feel like a party. But I'm reminded that when Jesus sent out that invitation, he sent out an invitation to a party. Number two, let's look at the invitation. Invitation technology has not changed all that much over 2,000 years. It's June. You know what that means, don't you? That means in February and March, I'm getting all kinds of mail for save the dates for weddings. Now, I know a lot of you know a lot of people, but I promise you, we get packed with wedding invitations. June's like crazy. June's the official wedding month. And we love it. But you know what they do? They send them and they say, save the date, right? Some people that are really on top of things, you'll get it last, you know, you'll get it the year before. Thank God we got phones, right? We can put that in. Save the date. You all have gotten it. That's really what would happen here. In Jesus' day, that's what this, that's what this, this, this master would do. He would save the date. He would plan this banquet, this party, and he would send out an invitation to the guest list that he wanted to be there. And it was understood in Jesus' day that with a party of this magnitude, you would say yes. You would approach that invitation as though it was yes, unless something greater was to come up and take the place of that. But that invitation to that banquet was up here. And you know, the Jews loved to party because they knew what it was like to be generations under the taskmaster's whip. 
They knew what it was for generations, to, for, for decades, to eat manna and bitter herbs. They knew what it was to wander and to not have a home. They knew what it was to work and labor. That's one of the reasons they would recline while they ate, because they wanted to enjoy it. They knew what it was to party because they had generations before them who suffered and hurt and went without in poverty and went without during droughts. So when there was a party, they were going to be there. And hear the invitation. The first one goes out, save the date. Okay, we'll be there. But then the second invitation comes in which the master sends his servant out to all of those who were first invited. Now this servant could be Jesus in the picture. This servant could be the Holy Spirit. This servant, I assume, could be a picture of John the Baptist. This picture could be one of the prophets of old. But what this servant was saying was going out saying, all things are now ready. Come. The day has arrived. The table is set. The master is waiting. Come. And one by one, one says, I bought land and I need to go look at it. One says, I bought oxen and I need to go check them out, test them. And one said, that woman that you gave me, one said, I got married and I can't go. By the way, Deuteronomy says that if you just got married, that could get you out of war, but not a party. Number three, the excuses. It would have been unheard of for the most part in Jesus' day for someone to buy land sight unseen. It would have been equally as crazy for someone to buy oxen as a farm implement and not test them before they bought them. I think we all understand what the man was saying with his wife. That's not a normal excuse in Jesus' day. What I want you to remember about this is that those excuses were incredibly weak. They were so obviously weak to the Master. He had prepared the table. He had prepared the food. Out of His love, He wanted to share this banquet with those select people. And He extends that invitation and it was understood that it was a yes and when the servant goes back and says, all right, we're ready to go. It's time. Let's go. They're like, ah, I can't make it. Did you notice that none of their excuses were sinful? Did you notice there was not one of them that said, I can't, I'm drunk. There's not one of them that said, no, I'm going to go meet up with a prostitute later. I can't, sorry. You know what's so crazy about that? They rejected this invitation because of misaligned priorities. Think about that for a minute. This party that should have been the most important thing on their calendar had fallen down here. Right now, all over the face of the world, on this day, from brick buildings to mud huts to underground churches, Someone is standing up in front of a group of people like us. And they're extending an invitation to the party. As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, all over the face of the world right now, someone is pleading 
to accept the invitation for the ticket that has been purchased through Jesus to everlasting life. And statistically speaking, a majority of the people will not respond because it's not that important. You've heard it before. I'll do it when I get married, start a family. I'll do it when my job changes. I'll do it later. I'll have time. I got a wife. I got a car. So much on my calendar right now. The last words in this story, the last words Jesus says, in that house. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Jesus is saying none of those people who were invited to the kingdom of God are going to get in. Think about the weight of those words. Not one of those people that I invited are going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Their chance is gone. Why? Misaligned priorities. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking anything away from sin. We're all on the same page. Every one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and not one of us has a right outside of Christ to sit in the kingdom of heaven. Not one of us. But when we have been invited as sinners separated from God to a, a party that we didn't have to pay for, that was already provided through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus, and for those people to say, I don't want it because other things are more important, they will have all eternity to roll that over in their mind. And oh, how will they be gripped with the truth that not one thing mattered more than that one decision. Not one thing was more important than the invitation to the banquet. I know as believers, for those of you that have responded to the invitation of Jesus Christ, you say this morning, you are born again and you are going to be blessed. You are going to be able to eat bread in the kingdom of God. Praise God. But there are others who continue to neglect, continue to push that off to some other day. The excuses were dishonoring to the Master. They were weak, and they revealed misaligned priorities. Number four, what was the result? I love this part. Servant comes back and says, here are the excuses. Did you notice the ones that didn't have an excuse made one and the ones that did have an excuse didn't use it? The master of the house becomes angry. Why? Because he made this party. It's all ready. And the master says this. You go out and find the blind, the lame. You find the crippled. You find the sick. And you get them in here because I want my house filled. And they come back and he says, we've done all that and there's still room in the house. Jesus now says, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Go to the byways. Go outside of the town. We could take this even as a picture possibly of the Gentiles being brought into the church. A foreshadowing of that event happening. Jesus says, go get them. I don't care who they are. Get them. Can you imagine with me plugging this back in to the previous teachings of Jesus? The man with the edema, the swelling that he healed. His teaching to practice the principle of inviting those who can't pay you back. Can you imagine with me for just a moment when that servant goes out and finds a man dragging his leg wrapped in rags, having to beg, the blind beggars. Can you imagine that servant going over to that man and saying, my master has invited you to a banquet? Me? 
He wants me? Yes. He wants you. Friends, that house that Jesus is describing was absolutely full of Mephibosheths everywhere. He wants me. I've never been invited to a banquet in my life. I've had friends that got to go. I've heard about them. But the master wants me, church, church. We're not the ones that were first invited here. We should be the ones that are saying, who, me? As sinful as I am, as wrong as I've been, nobody else cares about me, and you're telling me this guy who wants me at his party? That should be us. Humble, grateful, that an invitation from a good master would want me. I know, I know. You hear me say from this pulpit a lot that we get to come in. You've heard Jason say this. We say it together, that we get to celebrate Jesus. And we do. This party, we're going to get to celebrate Jesus. But I don't want you to ever forget this, ever. Is that Jesus isn't just inviting us to the party because he wants to celebrate with us. Jesus is inviting us to the party because he wants to celebrate us. Think about that for a minute. In the very next chapter of Luke, Jesus is going to tell three stories. And the first one is of the woman who lost the coin. And she searches all over the house. She lights a candle. She sweeps the floor. She finds the coin that was missing. And when she finds the coin, she calls to her friends and neighbors and says, come celebrate with me. For the coin that I lost is found. And then Jesus tells the very next story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one went missing. And he says that that shepherd leaves the 99 in the wilderness and goes and finds the one that went astray. And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and he comes rejoicing, saying to his friends, celebrate with me. And the capstone of that of that lost chapter is the one of the son who runs away and spends and squanders all of his father's goods on prostitutes and riotous living. And when that son has the moment and he comes to himself, his father sees him a great way off, runs, has compassion, falls on his neck, kisses him, gives him new Jordans, gives him a robe, gives him a ring on his finger. And then do you remember what the father does? He demands that the fatted calf be killed in the celebration in honor of that son. In honor of the son. Because my son who was once dead is now alive. In all three of those instances, in all three of those beautiful word pictures of lostness, Jesus references a celebration. The father uses the word celebrate three times talking about his son. An older son would sit out with his arms crossed, not going into the banquet, and the father doesn't understand it. Why won't you come in here and celebrate with my son? He was once dead, and now he's back. Friends, Jesus does not just want to celebrate with you. He wants to celebrate you. He paid a lot for you. He loves you. And we are reminded in Scripture there is more joy in the presence of the angels of God in heaven over one sinner that repents. More than 99 just persons. An invitation to a party. A moment was seized. He wants me? Yeah, I'll go. I'm in it. You're going to have to wait a little while, but I'll get there. Yeah, I'm in. And he takes it. A moment seized, contrasted with a moment squandered. They all received the same invitation. 
but they gave very different responses. And those words in verse 24 are chilling. I tell you, none of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. None of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. Very rarely in our culture are opportunities missed. They're forfeited. They're neglected. Most in this room, if not all, have heard the invitation and had it extended to them before. But other things became more important. Other things were a higher priority. You may think you'll do it later. But one thing I have learned in the school of Jesus is that when God is working on your heart, time is of the essence. There's a reason and a purpose He works on our hearts when He does. He who knows all things that are to come knows. And I believe that if there is a work on our heart that the Holy Spirit is doing, a decision He is calling us to, I believe it is there for a reason and a purpose. And none of us know when that moment will pass. Oftentimes when we hear an invitation, a response to respond, We think we will do it later. But let me tell you something. You are assuming that you are going to be as spiritually sensitive then as you are right now. Do not ever underestimate the power of the enemy to callous one's heart and to blind one's eyes. I would never assume that I'm going to be as spiritually keen tomorrow as I am today. I know myself well enough to know that when God speaks, when the invitation is presented, it is of the utmost priority. And I should respond, if you have never responded to that invitation to trust Christ as your Savior, to eat bread in the kingdom of God, praise God. You and countless others across the face of the globe today are going to respond to that call. Have the assurance that you are going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. And I pray if you've never trusted Christ that today would be that day You don't have to know all of the words. We have people that are trained to be able to walk with you and to pray with you and to lead you down that path. Maybe it is not a salvation experience for you, but a rededication. Maybe something God used in this message unrelated to the topic has pricked your heart. Maybe it's a place of rededication. God, the things of you, the things of eternity are not as important to me as they once were. And this morning you're repenting of that and rededicating, recommitting yourself to Christ. Maybe you've been here for a long time and God has moved in your heart to lead you to the place where you believe this is the place that He wants you to call home. And you want to unite with this church in membership. That's a decision that can take place right now this morning. Whatever it is, I pray that we would not Ignore the work of God in the invitation in our heart. Father, this morning, help us to respond accordingly to the decision we know. That invitation was clear. And I pray, Lord, that we would not leave with unfinished business yet to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me this morning? I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I had left a crimson stain he wore in white as snow Lord now indeed I find thy power and thine alone and change the leper's heart Yeah.
You're sent out to live for Jesus. God bless you as you do. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings. 